Our journey through Lent is different this year. That's, it's, it's quite a journey every year, but to, to go through this with a coronavirus pandemic and to see how challenging life can be and how weird it can become, perhaps, perhaps this serves a grander purpose for us all when we consider how Jesus gave up everything in eternity to humble himself and take on the role of a servant, counting equity with God, something to not be grasped, but to become poor so that we would become rich. During this season of Lent, certainly giving up something is a, is a fitting thing to do so that we can realize how hard it is to give up anything for a time. But to think what our Savior did and had the discipline and the fortitude to endure, that's what Lent is about. And as we travel into this fifth week of Lent now, we do so keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus, the one who has given his all so that in all and across all of the issues of our lives, we can know that he is with us and he is for us and that fixing our eyes on him can bring us through all the different kind of journeys that we take in this life as we travel to the shores of forever. Good evening and welcome to our live streaming process. It is almost Easter. This Sunday will be Palm Sunday and another opportunity for us to consider what Jesus was willing to do for the joy set before him. And you and I and the human race, where is joy and the reason why he did what he did for us. Our service is from our hymn book. It is responsive prayer number two, page 285 in our hymn book, page 285. O oh Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. Make haste, O oh God, to deliver me. Make haste to help me, O oh Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our psalm for today is Psalm 27, 
And uh, we have some of our psalms in our hymn book. And this happens to be in the front of our hymn book, Psalm 27. No matter how dark our days can be and how uncertain the future can look from our vantage point, we have someone who is with us. And that's what Psalm 27 is all about. Psalm 27, let's read it together. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. One thing have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. And I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. You have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger. O you who have been my help, cast me not off. Forsake me not, O God of my salvation. For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Give me not up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and they breathe out violence. I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our second psalm is Psalm number 144. Psalm 144. And Psalm 144 is not in our hymn book, but it's in our pew Bible. Psalm 144. So in Psalm 27, we take refuge in the Lord. We take shelter or safety in the Lord. And in Psalm 144, uh, we think of the Lord as our, as, as something more than a refuge, but as a drill sergeant, as a trainer. And um, there's all kinds of mixed metaphors in Psalm 144. Um, let's read it together. Psalm 144. Blessed be the Lord, my rock who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. He is my steadfast love and my fortress, my stronghold and my deliverer, my shield and he in, and he in whom I take refuge, who subdues peoples under me. O Lord, what is man that you regard him or the son of man that you think of him? Man is like a breath, his days are like a passing shadow. Bow your heavens, O Lord, and come down. Touch the mountains so that they smoke. Flash forth the lightning and scatter them. Send out your arrows and rout them. Stretch out your hand from on high. 
Rescue me and deliver me from the many waters, from the hand of foreigners, whose mouths speak lies, and whose right hand is a right hand of falsehood. I will sing a new song to you, O God. Upon a ten-stringed harp I will play to you, who gives victory to kings, who rescues David his servant from the cruel sword. Rescue me and deliver me from the hand of foreigners, whose mouths speak lies, and whose right hand is a right hand of falsehood. May our sons in their youth be like plants full grown, our daughters like corner pillars cut from the structure of a palace. May our granaries be full, providing all kinds of produce. May our sheep bring forth thousands and ten thousands in our fields. May our cattle be heavy with young, suffering no mishap or failure in bearing. May there be no cry of distress in our streets. Blessed are the people to whom such blessings fall. Blessed are the people whose God is the Lord. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. We sing hymn number 437. Hymn number 437.
in the name of Jesus, dear sons and daughters of God, during our journey through the season of Lent, we've been hyper-focused on John's gospel and looking at the last week of our Lord's life leading up to the cross. It's as if when John wrote his gospel, he wanted to say, dear reader, take heed to this hour that has come, the reason why our Savior came, and meditate on and take in what our Savior was thinking about, talking about, focusing on, so that you can find comfort in your trials and tribulations in this world. You know, we follow a liturgical season where we consider different seasons of the church here, and it's really intended to be a teaching tool for us to understand that while our life uh, is not about earning salvation, there are certainly things about our Savior's life that can teach us many things. Certainly, we are to take up, of our, take up our cross and follow Jesus, but not to Golgotha, where we have to sacrifice our life. But being a Christian means that there are going to be challenges in our life where we suffer. And the season of Lent is a reminder, not only of our Savior's journey, but how there will be times in our lives when we will suffer and suffer greatly. But then Easter comes, and as we celebrate our Savior's resurrection, we take in the good news that Jesus can take the ashes of our lives of Lent and turn them into Easter joy. And we go through the season of Pentecost, the season of green, where we slowly grow in many ways in our relationship with the Lord and our relationship with one another in the church. But then comes the other season of green, Epiphany, where there are times in your life and my life where we go through these rude spiritual awakenings, almost like mini conversions, where we learn in brutal ways the power of God's love and the crazy failure of our sinful condition. But in those epiphanies, still, there is growth to be had. And everyone likes looking forward to Christmas, the season of hope, looking forward to. Certainly, I would like to see in your life and my life plenty of uh, Advent, hope. The, the color is blue for blue skies and fair weather. But in the case of the church year that goes through all the seasons, your life and my life does the same thing. But I hope that even in the season of Lent, there are some discoveries that are being made in your, in your relationship with Jesus, so that through the season of Lent, there are those times of epiphany and even those times of Easter joy. I know that right now, because of the coronavirus pandemic, there's a lot of uncertainty, and that certainly marks more of the season of Lent than the season of epiphany. And we're not sure what's coming our way in the weeks and months ahead. Certainly the challenges of the the sickness, the illness, the virus are looming large in the next few weeks, and yet we can face whatever comes our way. Understanding this, Jesus faced his hour, and he did not shrink. And I really want to showcase that as we go through this section of the passion of our Savior Jesus when his hour had come. And, and keep in mind, that's the way chapter 12 started and then in chapter 13, we looked at his washing of the disciples' feet and his comments about betrayal coming on behalf of all the disciples. In chapter 14, he really honed in on where he was going. He was going home, and he wanted us to know that he is going to prepare a place for us. And that in the meantime, while we look forward to that, he also spent time showcasing what the ministry of the Holy Spirit would be once Jesus left, and how the Holy Spirit would comfort us and instruct us in many ways. And then Jesus, in chapter 15, talks about his intimate connection. I mean, his intimate connection, as close as a cluster of grapes is to the grapevine kind of connection that he has with us and all believers. And the power that comes through him into our lives so that we can bear good fruit that blesses all the people whose lives we touch. And so now 
as we get to chapter 16, things shift a little bit. It's like things are becoming more intense for Jesus. He wants the disciples to understand. And so we pick up in John chapter 16. If you have a Bible handy, why don't you grab it and open it up to John chapter 16. We start <clears throat> with verse 16. John 16, 16. A little while, and you will see me no longer. And again, a little while, and you will see me. So some of his disciples said to one another, what is this that he says to us? A little while, and you will see, not see me. And again, a little while, and you will see me. And because I'm going to the Father, so they were saying, what does he mean by a little while? We do not know what he is talking about. <clears throat> it is so interesting in the way the apostles wrote the scriptures. They weren't afraid to show their feet of clay and how hard it was for them to understand things and get things. <clears throat> it's rather interesting, John, when he writes his gospel, not only does he expose the, the feebleness of the disciples, but more than Matthew, <clears throat> Luke, and John, Mark makes them look like they're absolutely clueless in all kinds of ways. And the point, of make, the point that I'm trying to make here is we can relate. How many ways are we clueless? How many ways do we not get it? Or we find ourselves becoming a little condemning of others, only realizing that we don't get the big picture either. And so it's fascinating to see this transparency, this, this willingness on John's part to bring us into their confusion about what's Jesus talking about. So verse 19, Jesus knew what they wanted to ask him. So... so they're not even sure what to ask him. They're struggling with what's going on. But Jesus knows. And so he carries the day again and said to them, Is this what you are asking yourselves? What I mean by saying a little while and you will not see me. And again a little while you will see me. <laughs> Bingo. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. So also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again and your heart will rejoice and no one will take your joy from you. Wow, that's so powerful. In that day, well, let's just stop and think about that. So, so Jesus is trying to just as... Honestly and openly as he can, he's telling them that he's going. And they're going to be filled with sorrow. The world will be happy, uh, but he'll be back and he'll give them joy. And no one can take it away. It's fascinating to me in spending time last Wednesday and now this Wednesday, this section of his passion account it's all about Jesus telling them things so that they will have joy. In chapter 15, you know, he's talking with them about being connected to him. And then he says, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. And he, he has this as the theme. He wants his disciples to have joy so that your joy may be full. And, and, um, and then that becomes the theme here in verse 23 and 24. In that day you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. It's interesting how Jesus is shifting the disciples' focus from him to the Father. Jesus is the access to the Father. He is the bridge, and we in the word priest, priest literally means a bridge. So a priest is a bridge from one person to God. And so Jesus is the priest. In moments, we're going to look at his high priestly prayer, but Jesus is actually the bridge that now the disciples can walk on to ask the Father. Whatever you ask of the Father in my name, there he is. Jesus is the bridge. In the name of Jesus, amen. In the name of Jesus, we begin. 
In the name of Jesus, we ask these things. Ask of the Father in my name. He will give it to you. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive. Again, here it is, that your joy may be full. What Jesus is bringing was lost in the Garden of Eden. And what Jesus is bringing will not be taken away from you. And that is his joy. And that joy is the goal he has for you and for me. Some people write a letter and they end it by saying, joy in Jesus. And my wife likes to do that. And I, I say peace and good courage in Jesus or peace and love in Jesus. But it's really about joy. And if there's one thing right now that's being threatened in all of our lives, and it's joy. It's, it's hard right now. It's weird. It's weird in how we're receiving things and how we're processing things. Don't be surprised if you don't feel a little weird. And, and, but then understand what the Lord wants you to have is joy. I was thinking about this earlier today in Psalm 51, 12. David said, prayed, restore to me the joy of your salvation. So when do we need to pray that prayer? Whenever we see our joy being robbed of us. And there's a lot of reasons right now. I mean, I find myself just struggling for all the people whose, whose paychecks checks have stopped, who, who want to be involved in work. I mean, we have a school here, and our teachers aren't able to work, and I know they want to work. And um, I, I talked with one the other day, and, and it's just such a blessing to reach out and talk with some of our members and some of our teachers this, at this time, because, you know, joy is being threatened, and yet we can pray, restore to me the joy of your salvation. And that's what the Lord wants us to have. I mean, it's his theme here in chapters 15 and 16 and so forth. And then Jesus goes on. I have said these things to you in figures of speech. The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say, that, say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you. I mean, this is so precious. For the Father himself loves you. You see, the sacrifice necessary to remove all the wrath for all of our sin and transgression and wickedness would take place in, in like a day from this. And, and yet, Jesus already knows that what he is doing is knitting together this loving relationship, he's again the bridge. So Jesus, as bridge, is effective in ensuring that the Father himself loves you. And in truth, even before that sacrifice, God sent his Son because of love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. That love was even before the sacrifice. It's as if it was already done. And Jesus is carrying out the master plan of salvation. Because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. You see, it's interesting. When people start believing that what the Father has done in sending his Son, you see that loving relationship is being knit together. So I had to hurry up and get here. Because today I've had to have one of my HBA, HBAC systems replaced. And it was fascinating. You know, I tried to stay out of everyone's uh, way. I was their go for and worked on things. So I was working on preparing this message, doing emails, talking on the phone, <laughs> and also overseeing a big job. And then I had to also figure out how to get the water heater lit again because we had to shut off the gas valve because the valve that was shut off upstairs leaked. It's a long story, but uh, what's fascinating is just talking with some of the guys. And one guy in, in particular, when they found out I was a pastor, I talked with them. And one, one guy in particular, and we talked about how, you know, God doesn't want us to be religious. He wants us to believe in his son. And that believing in his son creates a relationship where we know that God isn't angry with us anymore. 
And, and I mean, isn't that a gift? I mean, that's, that's what Jesus did. He put together a broken spiritual HVAC system so that now we're reconnected to God and we have his cool grace and his mercy and his love. And, and that's what makes us his church. It's like using John 10, 16, where we can say, I believe in the sheep pen. You know, for years, we've confessed being put together by the bridge of Jesus so that we're one church. We, we call it traditionally the one holy Christian and apostolic church, the, the communion of saints. Uh, as I said moments ago, it's, we could call ourselves the sheep pen, but it's what Jesus has done. His whole goal is to create joy and that his joy would be ours and the Father's would be ours. And that's, that's what's so amazing about what's happening in this section of the, of, of the Passion account of our Savior's uh, last week. In fact, just less than a few days wrapping up before he fulfills it all by going the way of the cross. And how wonderful it is to know that we're a part of that because of what Christ has done, our good shepherd, and we are his sheep. We could use John chapter 10, verse 16, and say, I believe in the holy sheep pen, or the one flock with the one shepherd into me. I have given to them that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you love me. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Jesus is cherishing in his heart his relationship with his father but we know what will come in the cross we know what will come and yet this is his confidence and this is his peace and this is his trust O righteous father verse 25 even though the world does not know you i know you and these know that you have sent me i made to though i made known to them your name and i will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. It's all about the others as far as Jesus is concerned. It's not about him, it's about honoring his father. It's about making a connection that will last between us and him and all around among God's children, his family. And that's his high priestly prayer, his sacerdotal prayer. As the bridge, the priest, who is connecting the lost to the Father so that they may be one in him and that their joy may be full and that they may ask and it will be granted by the Father that he would be glorified through his Son and in us. What a beautiful picture this is, the passion of our Savior Jesus. And think about it. This is all just hours away from his rejection, from his betrayal, and from his suffering on the cross, facing the wrath of Almighty God, our Father, so that we would be reunited with our Father. And then chapter 18, when Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. This is the Garden of Gethsemane. So they leave the upper table, they leave the Passover meal and all that it meant. And now Jesus is going to the place where he will be handed over. Verse two, now Judas who betrayed him also knew the place for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? 
They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. So he asked them again, whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. Of those whom you gave me, I have lost not one. And that's John 6, 39. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? It's quite a statement at the end of our meditation for this evening. Jesus knew that he would take and drink the cup of God's wrath across and for all the ways that you and I have fallen short. He would consume it so that we would be free of that cup of God's judgment and wrath for his sake. Think about it. I don't know what, I, what you would be doing if you only had um, 24 hours to live. But I'm not sure if I'd be doing any of this. What passion our Savior has for us. What focus, what dedication he had to come to our rescue and to give us the assurance of God's love. This is a powerful, powerful place for us to stop. We know what's to come and we will save that until next week. But as we conclude, let us think about our Savior's holy passion and let's have a prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for your dedication to our cause. Lord, something far worse than a global pandemic was facing you. Yours was an eternal rescue mission to save us from a forever separation from our Father and from each other forever. It took nothing less than your suffering and death, facing all the wrath of God in our place to save us. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your holy passion. May the connection we now have to the Father through you give us joy, even during a time of uncertainty and unknown future, that our joy would be full. And when that joy is being robbed of us, Lord, teach us to pray. Restore to us the joy of your salvation. Lord Jesus, in your name we pray. Amen. We continue our service with responsive prayer. Page 285. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, have mercy. O Lord, have mercy. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. 
I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. <clears throat> Certainly, if you would like to worship the Lord with your offering, you know, there are ways that you can do that. You can send in an offering envelope uh, to our church building uh, through the mail. You can go to our website and use PayPal. You could also, if you have online banking, just go ahead and do the online banking thing and mail a check to us. And, uh, you know, we, we are going through the process of counting and also depositing. Um, or you can just offer up your praise for all the ways that God blesses you and blesses us because of his mercy. You know, we, we give not out of obligation, but out of thankfulness for what God has done for us through his son, our Savior Jesus. We continue with our versicles on page 286. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Let my cry come to you. In the day of my trouble, I call upon you, for you answer me. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. For you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I will sing for joy. Teach me your ways, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I give thanks to you, O Lord my God, with my whole heart, and I will glorify your name forever. May all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say evermore, God is great. Save your people and bless your heritage. Be their shepherd and carry them forever. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Listen to my plea for grace. So we say this prayer in time of disaster. Merciful God, Almighty God and Father, your thoughts are not our thoughts. Your ways are not our ways. In your wisdom, you have permitted this disastrous coronavirus pandemic to befall us. We implore you, let not the hearts of your people despair nor our faith fail us, but sustain and comfort us. Direct all efforts to attend the injured, console the bereaved, and protect the helpless. Bring hope and healing that we may find relief and restoration through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We pray for our nation. Almighty God, you have given us this good land in our, as our heritage. Grant that we remember your generosity and constantly do your will. Bless our land with honest industry, truthful education, and an honorable way of life. Save us from violence, discord, and confusion from pride and arrogance, and from every evil course of action. Grant that we, who come from many nations with many different languages, may become a united people. Support us in defending our liberties, and give those to whom we have entrusted the authority of government the spirit of wisdom, that there may be justice and peace in our land. When times are prosperous, may our hearts be thankful, and in troubled times, do not let our trust in you fail. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We pray for the church. Merciful God, we humbly implore you to cast the bright beams of your light upon your church that we, being instructed by the doctrine of the blessed apostles, may walk in the light of your truth and finally attain to the light of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We pray for those outside the church. Almighty and everlasting God, you desire not the death of a sinner, but that all would repent and live. Hear our prayers for those outside the church, 
Take away their iniquity and turn them from their false gods to you, the living and true God. Gather them into your holy church to the glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we pray our evening prayer together on page 287 in the middle. I thank you, my heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day, and I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless us, defend us from all evil, and bring us to everlasting salvation. Amen. We sing our closing hymn, Come, My Soul with Every Care, hymn 779. 779.